Kyle Pitts is a pretty big unknown for fantasy right now. He was drafted with a historically high pick for a tight end, and he went to what seemed like the perfect situation for his fantasy outlook. The Falcons offense has been pass heavy for years now, and it has produced a ton of fantasy points with Matt Ryan at the helm. With Julio Jones leaving town, Pitts seemed primed to step right into a big role in this offense right away, even though tight ends don't usually produce for fantasy in their rookie seasons. Strangely, the 2021 preseason came and went without really any hype for Pitts coming out of local media, and his fantasy production to start the season has been pretty underwhelming. However, when we take a look under the hood at what's been going on with Pitts, it becomes clear that he is set to break out in a big way, and he has a chance to have one of the greatest fantasy seasons of all time for a rookie tight end. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to my analysis series on 2021 fantasy football. Now, before I get started on the video, I just wanna say again, rest in peace to Tags, Mike Tagliere. Um, just because it's been a few weeks doesn't mean we've forgotten about the Tagliere family. So the GoFundMe page is actually still active and I, I don't know how long it's going to be up for. So while it is still up, I would suggest that you guys check it out, consider donating, supporting the family. Um, Really, it's only fair. Like, if you think about how much content Mike gave to us, high quality content for free for so many years, um, I just think of it as like a chance to kind of pay him back just a little bit at a time where his family could really use the support. So, the link will be in the description for the page, and <clears throat> as will Tabby Tags's Twitter handle if you want to reach out to her and send her some kind words. Um, but with that being said, let's get right back to the video. So the person that stands out to me when you watch his 2021 tape is that Kyle Pitts is just a freak. If you watched any of his college game film, you already know this. I mean, the kid was considered the greatest draft prospect of all time for tight ends. But even that right there is a little bit misleading because being listed as a tight end is kind of a cheat code for fantasy when it comes to Pitts because he doesn't actually really play the tight end position. He's really just a massive wide receiver, kind of in the same way that Juwan Johnson is for the Saints. He's 6'6", six six, 245 pounds, and he runs a 4'4", Like, that's just insane. He's three inches taller than DK Metcalf, 25 pounds heavier, and yet he's basically just as fast. Like, what? So why hasn't a freak athlete like that made a splash yet? Well, it really comes down to the way that the Falcons have been using Pitts. So let's get into that and take a look at what they've been doing. The first four games of the season have really been a tale of two halves for Pitts. Weeks one and two tell one story, while weeks three and four tell a completely different story. In the first two weeks of the season, the Falcons were playing it super, super conservative with how they use Pitts. Almost all of his targets came on short routes. Now, to keep things really simple, I'm calling every pass that traveled less than 10 air yards a short route, while any pass that traveled 10 air yards or more is a deep route. In his first two games, 11 out of his 15 targets were short routes. Now, that's just not the way he was used in Florida, and that's not the way he should be being used in the NFL. Don't get me wrong, Pitts ran his fair share of short and intermediate routes with the Gators, but what really made him special was his ability to stretch the field. And all Kyle Trask really had to do was kind of just throw it up high, and Pitts would go up and get it. It really didn't matter if he had a guy draped all over him or if there were two guys on him. If it was a high ball, there was a good chance that Pitts was the one coming down with it. Now I know it's such a cliche to say that for big receivers, like, oh, he's tall, just throw it up high. But for Pitts, it's really true. We saw it over and over and over again on his college film. He was just an awesome high ball catcher, which is what made it so weird that it was completely missing from his tape from his first two NFL games. Like I said, almost every target he got came on a short route, but the few deep routes that he actually got he had success on. He caught three out of the four, and the one incompletion only happened because Matt Ryan's arm got hit while he was throwing it. On the three completions, he flashed that athleticism that we know he has, and he also showed some pretty nice awareness for a young guy. Specifically on this seam route in week two against the Buccaneers, he showed some great awareness because as soon as he noticed that the Bucks were in a soft zone cover three look, he whipped his head right around and slowed down his route knowing that this was the window for him to catch the ball right now, and he needed to slow down before he ran himself into the next layer of coverage. That kind of awareness isn't something you always see with rookies, and it's great to see that it's coming to him so naturally at the pro level. Now in weeks three and four, the Falcons switched things up a bit and started to use Pitts in what I would say is the right way. 
Out of his 13 targets in these two games, only 5 were on short routes. So even though he saw fewer targets in this set of games than he did in the previous set, he actually doubled the amount of deep targets that he saw from that first set. Now for some reason he barely got any work in week 3 against the Giants, um, only seeing 4 total targets and all 4 came in the 4th quarter. But I think the Falcons kind of saw the error of their ways there because he rebounded in week 4 with the highest workload he got so far, seeing 9 total targets in the game. Also the targets that he saw in these games were much higher value, and if not for a couple of close misses with Pitts being overthrown and with defenders fouling him, um, he, he would have scored multiple touchdowns in these games. So while his fantasy production didn't really reflect it, these games were actually really encouraging signs for the way the Falcons should be using him moving forward. Now when you look at some of Pitt's stats, some of them are actually really misleading because they just don't take the whole picture into account. For example, he has an A dot or average depth of target of just 4.9 yards, which is really bad. It's just 32nd among tight ends, and it suggests that he's running only really short routes. However, the way they get that stat is, in my opinion, just stupid. It's just dumb. It just doesn't give you a good idea of what's actually happening, because what they do is they take his total air yards on passes that were caught, and then they divide that by his total targets, whether or not they were caught. Now what you should be looking at instead is his intended air yards, which takes into account all of the air yards on all of his targets, not just the ones that he caught. When you look at that stat and that average, you get a better idea of how deep he was down the field on all of his targets. When you look at those numbers, you see that Kyle Pitts is actually in elite company when it comes to tight ends. He's fifth in total intended air yards, and he's third in average intended air yards. When we look back at how his games were stacked up against each other in terms of this stat, you see that in weeks one and two, he was pretty much the same. He, in both games, he averaged a similar intended air yards per target of 7 and 7.3, so about 7.2 average between the two games. In weeks 3 and 4, that number jumps up to double digits both times, for an average between those two weeks of about 10.7 intended air yards per target. Now while 3 or 4 yards might not seem like a big deal, just for some context, what he averaged in those first two weeks ranks 14th among tight ends for the season, whereas what he averaged in the following two weeks ranks 2nd among tight ends for the season. And that's not even close to being the most important stat that is completely misleading when it comes to Kyle Pitts. Right now, Pitts is currently the tight end 19 in PPR scoring. So he's not even technically a back end tight end one. He's like in your tight end two considerations. And let me just break down just how ridiculous that is considering his usage. Okay, so Pitts is the tight end 19, despite having the sixth most targets among all tight ends. A lot of that comes down to his catch rate, since even though he's getting all those targets, there's still 15 tight ends who have as many catches as Pitts. He has a catch rate of just 65%, which is really low, despite the fact that he doesn't have a single drop credited to him. That just can't continue. It won't continue. And while we're on the subject of targets, Pitts has already seen six red zone targets, which is second among all tight ends. Only Darren Waller has more than him. And like we saw, Pitts was really close to cashing in on a couple of those targets, which would have just dramatically changed his ranking in terms of fantasy points scored. He's also running a ton of routes with the third most routes run by all tight ends, even higher than Travis Kelsey, for example. He has an elite route rate of about 94%. This means that when he's on the field for a passing play, 94% of the time he's running a route, he's not blocking. This is what I meant when I said that he's not really a tight end, he's basically just playing as a giant wide receiver. Only Travis Kelsey and Mike Gesicki have higher route rates among tight ends who have comparable route totals. Um, there are a couple guys such as like Zach Ertz or Juwan Johnson who are running 100% route rates, but they're not playing anywhere close to the amount that Pitts is playing. For example, both those guys, Ertz and Johnson, um, combined their total snaps are still less than the snaps that Pitts has logged and their total routes run is also less than the routes that Pitts has run. So in terms of tight ends with similar usage to Pitts, he has an elite route rate. He also has a 16.4% target share, which ranks ninth among tight ends, and it's fine. But keep in mind that he's just coming off of a week four game where he saw his highest usage, and in that game he had a 21.4% target share which would rank third among all tight ends. So if week four is more of an indication of what we're going to see from Pitts going forward, he's probably going to end up with an elite target share as well. 
I actually think we might start to see that happening right away in week five, since Calvin Ridley and Russell Gage are both going to be out for the London game. So with all of these stats pointing to elite usage for a tight end, the fact that Pitts is somehow just the tight end 19, it's just ridiculous. Um, I think the window to buy low on him is closing and it just might slam shut in week five. Looking specifically at the week five matchup in London, um, I think that there's a chance that the Pitts breakout game is not a given for everybody. And the Pitts owner might be a bit nervous about this potentially being a trap game or a big letdown game for him. Because when you look at the Jets passing defense in 2021, they stat out really, really well. So there's a chance that the Pitts owner in your league might be looking at this as an opportunity to sell Pitts while he's getting hyped before he disappoints with everyone watching him in London. But trust me, this Jets pass defense, it's a mirage. The only reason that they're standing out so well is because everybody has just been running on them so far with the lead. That's probably not going to be an option for the Falcons this week with how bad their run game has been with Mike Davis and his three yards per carry to start 2021. Now, Cordell Patterson has been the, the bright spot on this offense, but with Ridley and Gage out, I would expect to see them deploying him as more of a receiver, uh, more so than the runner. I just don't expect the Falcons run game to see a ton of success, um, especially not enough to keep them from going to their bread and butter, which is the passing game. Don't be scared of this Jets pass defense. They've allowed opposing quarterbacks to be extremely efficient so far in 2021. It's just that the volume hasn't been there because the other teams, they don't need to output that volume against them. The Jets haven't exactly faced a murderer's row of quarterbacks with Sam Darnold, Mac Jones, Teddy Bridgewater, Ryan Tannehill. But even against those guys, they've allowed a 70% completion percentage on average with zero total interceptions. What's really boosting their defensive stats is the fact that they've only given up two total passing touchdowns, which is a major, major outlier. And it really comes down to the fact that the other teams, like I said, they've just been running the ball a lot with the lead. The Jets have given up uh, at least 100 yards or more rushing in all four of the games, and they've only had the lead in a game for 10 total minutes of game time, which all came against the Titans in week four, in like the late fourth quarter. Other than that, the Jets had been basically dead in the water for the entirety of the rest of their games, and they had been going against mainly teams who were run first and who had the lead the whole time anyway. I don't think that's going to be the case in London, since I don't expect the Falcons to be able to really establish that run or play with a comfortable lead. So I expect Patterson and Pitts to get a ton of attention from Matt Ryan, who once again is near the top of the list in terms of passing attempts. Matt Ryan led all quarterbacks last season in terms of total pass attempts, and he's back at it again in 2021 with currently the eighth most pass attempts while playing on an offense with the eighth highest pass ratio. So the volume is going to be there for Pitts. And while it may have taken a little bit longer than we maybe wanted it to take, the Falcons coaching staff seems to be finally be putting Pitts in the position to be the difference maker that we know he can be as a field stretcher. So while so far he may have been a bit of a disappointment for you considering where you drafted him in your fantasy league and where the Falcons drafted him in real life, but all the stats are pointing to him starting to break out and it's probably going to happen really soon. So if you have him on your team, I definitely would not be trying to sell him right now. And if you don't have him on your team, I would 100% be trying to make a move to get him. If the Pitts owner in your league, maybe they're desperate for a certain position, or maybe they just can't wait around for Pitts any longer to kick it into high gear, I would definitely consider either targeting him in the trade or making him a secondary piece in a trade where you're improving them at a different position because you just might end up with one of the elite tight ends for fantasy this season. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. Um, I'm going to be back next week with another analysis video. And as always, on Tuesday mornings, my waiver wire top targets post is going to go up on Reddit. So follow the thingy there and you'll see my post there on that account. Um, it'll have write ups for all of my players and links to their every play videos, which you're going to see those every play videos start going up from Sunday night all the way through till Monday, Tuesday morning. Um, and they're all going to be collected on a playlist as well. But if you want more of an in-depth explanation as to why I like those guys as pickups that week, head over to the post, check it out. Um, follow my Twitter and my Instagram. I've been posting a lot of stuff on there recently, and I will see you guys in the next one.